highly, highly encourage you to, to check that out if you're in town, uh, cause it's a lot of fun. Um, and on that note, uh, we should probably get rolling on this because it's Saturday night, Sunday morning for Dave, and we don't want to keep you all too, too long, but, uh, we also want to, uh, make sure that, uh, you're all, you know, have a dram. We don't want you to wait too long. You got to wet your lips here. Uh, so we're really excited to have the global brand ambassador for not just Boutique now, but for all Adam Brands whiskeys, Dave Worthington, join us. Dave, I think we've done this almost a dozen times now, or close to a dozen times. You're a very we, good sport. We've done it a few times. It's, yeah, it's always always a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, it has been a long day today because I have been at a whiskey festival all day today. Uh, I was on a train earlier this morning down into London and then back this afternoon. But I've got my second wind. I'm ready to rock and roll. That's right. Well, you're also a professional. It should be noted. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd, like the... to, I'd like to sign up for that Canadian whiskey tasting with Davin de Kergamo because I want a copy of that new book as well. Well, at the very least, Dave, if it doesn't show up on your side of the pond, I'm sure I can get a copy of that book over to you next time I'm over. Um, it can got... It can be arranged. I've got the original one, which is a, which was a cracking read. So I'm really looking. I, I, yeah, I saw he'd got one and got in touch with him the other couple of weeks ago, and just it's uh, yeah, that would be good. Yeah. Uh, so Dave, um, we're starting off with something which sadly you don't have, um, but you have something similar, and then uh, we're talking Isla whiskeys tonight, or not Isla? Sorry, peated. Uh, there was a bit of a Freudian slip there because everything is the World of Smoke series. So we've got uh, an interesting range of whiskeys from the World of Smoke series. Um, but yeah, as our as our palate cleanser to whet all of our appetites for bigger and bolder things to come, we're going to start off with uh, something a little different from everything else in the range. And I don't know, maybe you can give us some insight because there's been a few bottlings from what I assume is a parcel of this stock that may or may not have been acquired. Um, do you want to maybe give us a little lead into that? Yeah, we, we bought quite a bit of this 23, 24, 22 year old, uh, single malt from a big distillery in Speyside. And, uh, yeah, we've been sort of eking it out in little, little release here. And this was an exclusive for you alongside our cinema release. So we did a collection of whiskeys with, with shockingly bad puns. Um, where we tried to find a movie to fit each whiskey and did a series of movie posters called our cinema collection. And this one, we, where did we, I, I don't know anything about movies and I can't always remember all the movies because well, I don't watch. I know the inside joke on this one, Dave, if you don't know this particular one, it's, it's, and do you want me to share this or I can't remember if this is one of the whiskeys in your deck or not. Cause it not, is, yeah. you're, you're, I've got your label on here, actually. So uh, let me just Great. see if I can get that up now. Can I do that? I can, can I? Let's just... Uh, screen one, that's the one. Have we got that? We do. That's great. It's excellent. So as I was saying, Dave, if you don't know the reference, although your name is on there... Uh, yeah, well, because this was a secret space side, and on on the original label for this, this is the one with me on it with the banjo, um, being given the banjo by the whiskey whiskey gods. So that, yeah, it was there was a tie in there as well. But this is um, it's it's two thousand one a space odyssey. That's what it is. It's all about the computer hal, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm sorry I can't let you do that, uh, but substitute your name and you can't name it but uh there are some some interesting clues in references to this particular space side number four distillery that might narrow down the list of choices that it's from yeah i think we we, we did the computer because the, the distillery is more or less run by a computer these days isn't it i think that was one of the joke the in jokes about it but yeah it's 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 one of the big space side distilleries i think there's two with the maximum capacity now and it's not glenfiddich yeah. but i bet you, i bet you'll glen love it yeah well i i, I hope they're going to glen love it because the profile in this now i know you don't have the exact cast in front of you dave but it's very spirit driven very tropical very creamy there's some nice floral top notes on it as well and it 
on the palate, it's just a banger. It's so easy drinking, just lush. Tons of fruit, toasty, a little bit nutty. It's it's a beautiful single malt. Yeah, I don't I don't have the cast details for that one. Um, but yeah, that's a that is a cinema series. So we did a whole series of um movie posters with the little bright lights around there, and we did like the, that that they all look they just look superb together, I must admit, the cinema series. Mm -hmm. Six movies like uh you know, we had a spaghetti western for uh, an, an Italian whiskey with the the good dog, the good the good boy, the good boy, and the good boy, because he had dogs on the label and Oh, Mad Racks for an Australian whiskey and uh, wow. <laughs> Charlie with chocolate, um, Clockwork Orange Stroke, um, Angel Share for Bal Blair. Just, just, yeah, just silly silliness, but uh, hmm. shockingly bad puns, but it did look good. Almost dad jokes, which kind of is a, an accepted form of humor these days. Well, it's because I'm a dad. <laughs> That's <laughs> weird. That makes two of us. I'm sure there's yeah. a few other people in this tasting that qualify for That's that. Right. Well. We're, we're, all, we're all good at dad jokes. We're, we're perfect at doing dad jokes now. Yeah. Yeah, it's lovely. This I do do love a bit of space side. I always seek out a good space side when I was. Well, and I think the magic with this whiskey, Dave, is this is nothing to do. I mean, the cask has a role, but the cask is not necessarily the driving factor in it. It's just time. It's time in that oak cask. Um giving it the opportunity to grow and, and become more fruity and more, you know, voluptuous. And uh, yeah, it's a great drinking strength, 47.8%. Uh, we're really happy with it. Um, and bang for buck, $175. It's kind of hard to beat. So um, we've been pretty, pretty happy with that as a, as a single cask for the shop. Yeah, I think. Um, hey, that's gone. Okay, good gone i've just lost it what have i done ah oh, dang for those who don't have it i'm just going to put that in the link for you uh if any of you want to have a look at it uh as always encourage you to put uh comments questions in the chat um you'll note uh uh put a hat on i don't know i think all boutique whiskeys we should encourage people to wear a hat I... uh, it seems to be tradition Bring, bring. I, I'm trying to bring hat wearing back. I must admit, I, 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 I think, think more people should be wearing hats. It's very sensible to wear a hat, especially when it's cold. Well, not just or that. It's funny. I've got sun hats as well, but uh, yeah, sun exposure. Exactly. I mean, there's not as much up here as there used to be, so you know, I got to protect it a little bit at times. <laughs> yeah, I've got a room for. You can't see them in here, but I have got a room for the hats, uh, at least. Oh, I've got to say a good 12 in here. Yeah. Uh, well, great starting, Dram. Hope everyone liked it. I'm sure some of you might have already had a chance to try it. But uh, um, Dave, maybe this is a, a chance like we can segue into the world of smoke uh, because it isn't just one country. We've got a we've got three different countries here. I know your world of smoke was an even broader range, but uh um, for the tasting, I kind of cherry picked this a little bit because I, you know, those mystery Isla malts, I really wanted to get in there. And I see. this is the first time we've had a boutique Kalila that was actually named. So I also wanted to get that into the lineup. Oh, okay. We, 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 we've done quite a few boutique Kalilas that we have been up and named. Okay. Our world of smoke series. I mean, it really is kind of special. We, I mean, this is our headline series and we're going to taste two of our headline uh, and I'm, I'm I generally talk about the headliners and the scotches follow along and we will go, we go through a nice lineup of scotches um you know when you talk about smoky whiskey uh, generally you automatically think of those big isla hitters but there's so much more to smoky whiskies than those isla peat monsters uh, there are many types of peat across scotland uh, from isla to ardnamurchan on the west coast to the highlands of speyside around tom and Tal, and to the east coast near Bora. Uh, and right up into the Orkney Islands, and they all give a sort of a different profile. And we will try some of these, uh, the Scotch ones, shortly afterwards. Um, so while traditionally peat has been used for flavouring malt in Scotland, the New World has been doing other stuff. They've been using other local organic matter to flavour their malts. 
smoked malt for beer brewing has been around for a, a really long time. And it's not something I really, it's only when you start thinking about it. And well, of course, it was a fuel. It was a, a cooking fuel. So everything would have been smoky once upon a time. Uh, so in, in Germany, the is often referred to by its German name of Rauchmaltz, uh, usually based on two row spring barley, and it's invariably smoked over hardwood. Softer woods such as pine are too resinous and produce a, uh, don't produce a very pleasant uh, tasting smoke. Um, and and that the favoured fuel for beer malt smoking is, is beech wood. But they also use alder um, and birch, but beech wood is the, sort of the, the beer malt wood smoking um, and it imparts sort of a bacony flavour to the malt. Uh, our headliners here, which you can see across the screen, I hope, uh, really do span the globe. And we, we've got an English and a Dutch one in the lineup. We're going to start with the Adnams. The Adnams. Um, Adnams is a cracking English distillery. It's, it's, I'm a huge fan of this distillery. Uh, this is from an Isla cask um, rather than a, a smoke. So not actually a smoked whiskey in itself. So this has been in refill French oak and then into an ex Isla cask. Our, our headliners using all sorts of different things in here to smoke their malts. Uh, we've got four different woods in here. Uh, there's a birch wood, there's a beech wood, there's an older wood, and there's a mesquite um, smoked for smoking the malt. There's also German peat, there's Scottish peat, there's stinging nettles. Um, yeah, there's some uh, there's some really interesting whiskies in here, but this is where we are. Uh, this is so I, I was asked to put how smoky is smoky. And so you notice some of these wood smoke and nettle smokes uh, are much lighter on the smoky tail. And, and, and our adnums here starts off down here. Sort of in the middle. It's not rich. It's not light. It's not heavily smoked. It's just gently smoked. Let me do the glass. There's, there's something here that reminds me on the nose of, uh, you know, those pellet burners that you have in a lot of homes in uh, the UK, uh, like for heating your home. It's not like it's a little different than wood, but it's like, I don't know, condensed wood or something. It reminds me of the smoke that comes off of those. So our uh, Adnams is this one here, and then we're going to go to the Millstone, which is just across the road, and we go over to Scotland, and we can pull this up again later. I can flip back to this, but this is our Adnams. Um, <clears throat> Adnams is a little distillery. It's a brewery, actually, uh, Adnams Beer. It's, been, it's a very long-established brewery, um, but they were one of the early English whiskey distilleries, about 2010, I think their distillery opened, uh, the Copper House Distillery, right within the brewery, a very popular brewery over here, Adnams Ales. Um, they own hotels and restaurants all around the area on a beautiful um, area called Southwold in Suffolk. And they've been making some really great whiskey since, say, 2010, but they've never shouted about it. It's only just starting to be spoken about. They've been really quietly making. I've just tried a 12-year-old from them today, actually. It's very, very good. Yeah, I mean, it's so, Dave, like, how long did they wait to release their first whiskey? Because, I mean, you think a lot of craft distilleries now, they're releasing stuff either before it hits three or shortly thereafter. Um, is this something that just kind of was under the radar for the longest time? They just weren't in a rush to release it? Well, no, they did release their first whiskey in 2013, but it's not their primary business. Um, and and, and the pan, their primary business has been bars and hotels, a, um, a big, big, big a chain of chain of bars, uh, pubs across East Anglia. And the pandemic really hit them hard. Mm. And um, they turned it. That, you know everything went back into beer making because they had beer sales and gin gin and spirits that they could turn around and turn it for cash so they actually stopped whiskey making when everything was locked down here for a little while because they were just trying to turn it into cash because all their pubs and hotels were closed uh what's their usp here well they use local grains um and they have a self-cultivated brewer's yeast that's over 80 years old mm -hmm. well over years old this brewer's yeast that they've been using um 
and, and so that's their USP. They they generally put a lot of stuff in French oak. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they've got some lovely warehouses up in Suffolk up there on the coast, um, full of beautiful new French oak cast. This was a refill, a uh, second fill French oak cast, and then followed by the Isla. Mm -hmm. because that smokiness comes through afterward, but that malt is always really chewy on here. Uh, I, our label story on here, there's a lot of ghost stories because this has been around for a long, long time, this this brewery, this family, um, and there's a lot of ghost stories back in some of their old pubs. So we we turned it to a modern twist with ghosting, uh, with ghosting on a text, being ghosted on a text. So it's a, it's a shockingly bad pun. Um, we're talking about Joanna on here. Joanna is one of the ghosts that's been spoken about in one of the hotels. Um, and on this one, we just ghosted it with a boo, uh, and we just put a little puff of smoke afterwards on the on the text as batch two because we did a batch one in our English series, our Home Nation series, a little while ago, a couple of years ago. Mm. It's it's now, an interesting color, but you can definitely pick up that French oak character. Like, there's quite a bit of spice here, even after even for a refill cask. Um, there's also a leathery note to it, and I'm not sure where that's coming from, but it it kind of reminds me of like, you know, a, a nice pair of leather shoes that you've maybe been in all day and you just take them off. There's kind of a little bit of a funk to it and, and not in a bad way. It's just there, that's the kind of the leather note that I'm getting from it, especially on the nose. Huge brand of this distillery. Mm. I've been making some great whiskey there. I've tasted some of their rye today. That's just spectacular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's got a nice palette to it. Um, very, very malty, as you said, a little bit honeyed, quite a bit of spice. Um, and the price on this is actually not too bad. I mean, $80, uh, you know, for craft whiskeys. I mean, the, the, we were talking about this a little bit just before the start of the tasting. Like a lot of the craft distillers, their prices are high because their costs, their input costs are high. Um, but the price on this was very approachable. Um, so it was worth taking a bit of a gamble on. I'd never had an Adams before, but I'm uh, pleasantly surprised by it. Yeah, they 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 really haven't really been waving the flag. I mean, they, they, their beer is pretty popular over here in 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 the pubs. Their broadside and their ghost ship um, ales are quite popular over here. But they, they did just started off distilling their beer when they first put the stills in. But they do a lot of gin and vod um they've got some really big columns for doing vodkas there so they, they do their own um and, and they use the same malt uh to do their their base spirit for gins and vodka as well which is kind of cool they're quite tasty but it is a little village on a little fishing village on the on the coast in the middle of nowhere uh, so it's a very long drive from here right out on the coast of suffolk but beautiful it's like stepping back in time going into this village Lots of little bright coloured beach huts along the beach. Mm. Uh, very pretty. But yeah, that that um so they're local grains, they're they're big environmentalists, so they have a they have a resident beekeeper, they have a huge green roof on their uh distribution place. So it's a it's a roof that's like the Teletubbies at um like M M McCallum, but um much better. <laughs> um yeah, uh, on their distribution. So, they're, yeah, they're, they're a sort of a, an ethical supplier, local farmers, Ooh. local grains. Yeah, big fan of what they're doing. Good for them. That's a, it's an interesting story. And if I ever find myself in the, the, the environs of Suffolk, I will go to check it out. Well, you can do the English Whiskey Company first and then go on and go through, go through yeah. Norfolk. I've, I've, not, I've not been to that, I think. I've I've only been to two distilleries in England. I've been to Cotswolds and I've been to Bimber. And right. uh, I'm not sure what's happening with the latter of those two, but uh hope, hopefully it'll survive the current uh the current turmoil, tumult as it were. That was a bit of a yeah, that was a big bang in the yeah. Nobody yeah. saw that. <laughs> you know, Dave, that's that's true, but I mean I'm sure you've been to the distillery as well. It is like stepping onto the set of a Guy Ritchie movie. So at the same time, it's also not entirely surprising, um, I have to say. But well, yeah, hopefully it has a positive outcome. 
Well, I think the the team have been put in charge, and there, there's other people in the in the company. So the the, the Scottish distillery is going ahead and, and making, and I think Bimba's going ahead on the um, yeah. the rest of the team. So while well, this gets sorted out, yeah. Well, anyway, um, all right. Where are we on to now? We're off to the Netherlands. Ah, oh, our favorite, our favorite Dutchman, our favorite distiller, Patrick van Zledam. That's him there in his little Willy Wonka hat, his top hat. Uh, we call him the Willy Wonka of, of distilling. He he is, and at long last, he has been recognised with an icon of whiskey this year. We've been fans for a long, long time. This man grew up in a distillery. His father was a distiller in the Netherlands and decided he could do a better job and went off and built his own distillery. So Patrick and his brother actually grew up in a distillery. So uh, it's the this. A distillery was his playground. He made his first spirit cuts at the age of 12. What this man doesn't know about distilling isn't worth knowing, I'm sure. Everything he touches, and this is why we have lots of copper pot stills on here. He has a collection of copper pot stills. He's in love with copper pot stills. Uh, he makes great single malt. He makes great rye whiskey. He makes great grain whiskey. He makes a beautiful rum we bottled his rum and he makes really tasty geneva where it all started from because his father was a geneva spirits they do use a windmill to grind their grain uh their 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 their, their grain is not all of it now because they just couldn't keep up with the windmill so they have got mechanical uh grinders um mills basically to uh grind the grain but they do use a lot of local grain he always uses pot stills he uses a very very fine cut very very narrow spirit cuts he's just a, a perfectionist in distilling and he likes using big new casks and um he, he has had access to some amazing sherry casks as well some really old sherry casks that he pulls out this is a px cask first bill px hogsheads that he's put in now this is a very heavily peated malt and you wouldn't tell that from uh from your first yeah the sherry is really hiding the peat but i mean that's that's not uncommon dave i mean a lot of sherry whiskies i find our big Yugadale is a good example of this. The, the sherry cask influence tones down, uh, at least on the nose, often on the palate as well, that peat character. So it's not too surprising to me. Yeah, it does. It takes time. It takes time. You get that, um, I always get that sort of fennel note from nearly all of his distillates. And it's a sort of a distillery character that comes across his rye, it comes across his Geneva. And then it settles down. This is um, 55 ppm in the malt, which is higher than Kalila and Lagavulin, who uses 35 ppm. But he takes a very, very narrow spirit cut. Um, he does very, very long fermentations at low temperatures in small batches. And they, uh, so over five days fermentation. And he does a slow distillate. And incredibly narrow and that subdues it becomes really elegant yeah it it you know it's funny because it doesn't even on the palate for me the peat is not overwhelming it's it's actually quite tamed and quite subtle yeah it comes through on the finish more than mm -hmm. it's so elegant it's it's such an elegant malt i'm a huge fan of everything well, that man does on the second sip on the finish the smoke is just it, it um all of a sudden sort of envelops your palate um but it's it's there's such a nice balance there of fruit malt smoke and a little bit of the sherry like almost leathery tannins coming from it yeah that's a great balling i mean if you tasted this blind how many people would think this is a four-year-old whiskey uh, uh, it it doesn't taste like a four year old whiskey at all to me. Didn't we do his twenty five year old on your last tasting? We did. We did. We did your your tenth birthday series. Yeah, uh, yes. And there's there's been some chitter chatter about that. Uh, Jeff and I have been back and forth in the chat.
because that that millstone 25 year old from your anniversary series is without question in the top 20 sherried whiskeys I've ever had. It is absolutely gorgeous, um, old school style sherry. And you were talking about this. You know, I remember Patrick telling me when I visited him, the reason that he's got in some ways a more old school style of sherry cask than much of the industry has is that he couldn't get access to the sherry season cask that everyone else was using. And so he kind of ended up finding his own supply of um, Solera and maturation casks that most of the industry doesn't even bother trying to source anymore. Yeah. He has some casks that are hundreds of years old, you know, over 100 years old that have been worn out in a Solara, but he plays with them. Yeah. So Dave, question here in the chat from Bob. Where is Millstone getting the peat? Are they buying, bringing in peated malt from Scotland? Where's the where's the peat coming from? I think it is. I'm, I'm pretty certain he told me it was Scottish peat on this one. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is Scottish peat. I'm pretty certain. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to look for that, actually. I, wish I thought I had that, but... Um, so, Dave, I'm, while you're looking for that, I'll just go on. I mean, to kind of toot Patrick's horn a little more. Um you know, not only does he make great whiskey, he makes rum, he makes gin, Jennifer, he makes like other things like cassis, like liqueurs. I mean, calling him Willy Wonka is, you know, basically bang on when you consider all these other things he does. And I mean, with their importers at some a certain point, I had to tell them no more. Like I can't have any more Zweedham's products, regardless of how good they are, because I, I can't give them all that much space. But Everything he makes, he makes like exceptionally well. And it, it, it's that maybe there's something about that Dutch character that if you're going to do it, you're going to do it well. You're not going to cut corners in it. And because he's he is meticulous in everything he does. He is. He lives in the distillery. Every time you call him up, he's in sitting next to a still. Mm -hmm. uh, I asked him if he come and talk to us, talk to people about his rye. And he said, try telling, try, try stopping me. Um, he, he just loves talking to people about what he's doing and, and, and his passion for it all. I can't see it written down any here, but I'm pretty certain this is, um, is uh, Scottish Pete that he's bought in. I'm, I'm surprised our fact checker, Jeff, hasn't already jumped on that, but I'm going to do a quick, uh, a quick dive in here and see if I can figure out the answer to that question. Uh, it's very little outside of Scottish peat, to be honest. We've got some German peat in this series from a uh, little distillery called Hercinian, but we haven't got that on here tonight. And I'm talking to an English distiller today who's using some English peat, which is really called cool, Somerset peat that he's gone out and dug up and he's malted some of his own, own barley. So that's really cool, but not a lot elsewhere. Elsewhere, I, I think one of the Australian distillers was doing some Australian peat lime burners. I think they've got some Australian peat going on as well. But yeah, few and far between. Most people use Scottish peat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, even even in Canada, there's a lot of distillers that use for their peated whiskies. They're using um, Scottish peat because. You know, there's not as many places here that are used or, or maltings that are used to doing that. I believe they are able to do that now in Alberta. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it not. And the other thing is not all peats are really suitable. I don't know if you ever try these or if I've mentioned these in a tasting with you, Dave, but many years ago, about a decade ago, an, an importer approached me about an American single malt. And this American single malt had been peated with a whole bunch of different peats from North America. Uh, three of them were from Alberta, Northern Alberta, and they were, I, and I don't know if it was the Pete's fault or the, just the distiller's fault, but th they were not great whiskeys. So we passed on them, but <laughs> uh, I don't think all peat is destined to be used to smoke malt, I guess is where I'm going with that. So just because I you can grow peat doesn't mean you should use it for whiskey. I guess the the Scotch whiskey makers have perfected it over the years. I guess there would have been some ropey stuff in the days because they, they they you know today peat is used as a flavouring smoke. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the past it would have been used for drying the malt as well. It was a heat source as well as a, you know it's just an accidental flavour. But now it's controlled. They don't use peat for drying the malt. It's just a short sharp 
smokiness and then they've got the hot air going through uh once the peat's been you know so many hours of peat smoke and that's only there just to infuse the green malt and then they'll switch it over to hot air afterwards so it's 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 a very carefully used commodity now peat is it they use an awful lot like they would have done in old days and it's you know it's not like turf burning continuously like if you if you go around some of the little villages of um of ireland you will smell that gentle peat wick all the time as a little cottage is just smoldering away turf you know, dave the first time i was driving in ireland i thought i was burning out the clutch and then <laughs> i was like no 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 it's it's not the clutch that's their people are burning turf and i was yeah. like okay um i because i thought i was a good driver and then i started questioning myself and then I learned they were all just burning peat. There's some skinny roads over there, aren't there? I mean, they're really skinny roads, but dead straight. Yeah. Hey, okay. Shall we go to Scotland then? Yeah, let's I, let's head off to Isla. I wish we were doing all of the New World ones, but I guess you didn't take a lot of the New World ones because they are a bit out there. Um, but I think they're uh, I think they're really worth looking at as a, as a whiskey geek. Um, okay, so these are the nine smoking scotches that we bottled with this series. And, and Ardmore, which is where we're going to start. A uh, Kalila, we have a Crofton Gear and a Inch Moen, I think we had, and a Highland in the middle, and two um, secret islands here that look remarkably like our uh, a Lafoig label. Uh, and then we're going to finish with a Le Chig because we haven't got the Octomore which is a very nice optimal, I must admit. I love this label. I want this on a T-shirt. I must get this on a T-shirt, I must admit. This is a 19-year-old Ardmore. Our label is a shockingly bad pun because Ardmore is, or was, is still, I think, the, the sort of spiritual home of teachers blended Scotch whiskey. And if you go to the distillery, you'll see in, in the old distillers, manager's hut still got the, the old teacher's logo on so we just put a cask on there and it's teaching you the parts of a cask as simple as that that's what the story here is teaching it's just a shockingly bad pun and we're teaching you because it's teachers mm -hmm. the difference on this one is um the px cask so what we've done here with the uh with the ardmore this uh was this sept what did i say this was um September 2003 distilled, uh, spending most of its life in the good old refill hoggy, like nearly every Scotch whiskey spends its life. Um, just about everything. It's a standard cask over here, the refill hoggy. Uh, all, all of the specialised casks are used afterwards. And because mm, the stuff that we get offered as a independent bottler, most of that is fillings, just like every other independent bottler. They're buying fillings from bonders or from the distilleries. And so we've re racked this into a first fill PX sherry cask. And so I've got a, a big sh PX sherry finish on it. It's delicious. It's one of my favorite Ardmores for a while, I must admit. Yeah, Dave, there's comments on this that people would, would have bought this for a T-shirt. Um, that uh, you should almost turn that, that sketch into a T-shirt. I'm sure you can download the label off our website. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and just I did put I did put the info in the chat. We didn't we did bring this one in, but we don't have it in the tasting lineup tonight. But uh, um, yeah, it is a cool uh, a cool release. There will be probably a future Ardmore tasting. It's one of the the many ideas that we've got teed up for the the weeks and well months ahead. Probably in the the slower times, June July, we might see an Ardmore tasting crop up. But oh, you haven't you haven't got this in the lineup. No, no, we've, I think, I, and I've, if that was on your list, it's, it's my bad, but no, we've got, uh, we've got the Kalila 14, the Highland 18, and then the Mysteries followed by the Latex. Okay. okay. But, uh, but it doesn't mean you can't romance people on it, Dave, like sell away. I, I just watch, watch me sip this and go, hmm, nice. <laughs> <laughs> All uh, right, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it it is a cracking. So Ardmore has traditionally been one of the only distilleries in the region constantly producing whiskey with a, a phenol spec in the barley of around twelve to fourteen ppm. So not an awful lot. 
uh, their peat source is generally the sort of an earthy peat uh, rather than the maritime peat of, of, of Isla on the west coast, sort of a highland peat from St. Fergus. Yeah, it's just uh it's it's a it's a beautiful distillery to you can't very often get into it, but you can drive past it. It's in the middle of nowhere up on a on a on a moor it's there. Good. And uh, you can get in there, you know, if no one's around on a Sunday, you can get into it and just drive. It's, it's amazing that you can just drive around these distilleries when it's when it's closed and walk around. Nobody nobody challenges you. There's no security there. I guess maybe they don't put a lot of their stuff in the warehouses there because there's very little security. I mean, I've driven around Speyside and walked into lots of distilleries on a Sunday afternoon when I'm killing time waiting to fly home. And uh, no one challenges you as you're walking around these places. But mm. this, this Ard Ardmore never really had a brand for a long time. It was always uh, independent bottlers. Most of it went, and still most of it goes into blended Scotch whiskey, but they do have a small sort of brand over here these days. But it's it's quite new. Okay then. Uh, what did I? Oh, was I going here or going to Kalila? Kalila, yeah. Kalila. Is that right? Is that what we want to do now? Yeah, yeah. I think Kalila. Kalila is a great place to go. Okay, cool. Let's go to Kalila then. That's what you have. Wrong, what, wrong order there then have we got Kalila we got everyone got a Kalila put your hands they up you should yeah Kalila yeah. so this is a, a, a refill hoggy that we bought that was December 2008 and we re-racked this into first pill Oloroso Octobs um, to give this a big, bold, fruity flavour. You know, once again, like the millstone, like that that sherry influence is kind of tam tamping down some of that classic Kalila peat on the nose. Like it's not, it's got a bit of that there. It's got a bit of salt, a bit of smoke, but it's, it's yeah, there, there's more nuance to it than than just getting hit right off the bat with a big whiff of peat smoke. Yeah, we bottled this one at natural cast strength. You can see that little NCS up in the top left-hand corner of our label. That means natural cask strength. Mm -hmm. We never used to identify it before, uh, but people were asking for it. What, what's cast strength? What isn't? You know, we'd always bottle stuff. Really, generally, we weren't bothered about cast strength. We would bottle it what we thought tasted best at. Mm -hmm. um, but people said they wanted cast strength, so we started bottling more cast strength because that's what people wanted and we've identified it with this little gold triangle on the top left hand corner yeah it, you, you do to a certain extent dave have to sometimes give the people what they want um uh and especially when it comes to isla malts i think people just want they want they want the real goods they want it uncut unpolished just as just as it was in the in the oak cask <laughs> I love how Emily's got this seagull crashing into the window mm -hmm. on this one. It makes me laugh. Say, are the seagulls in league with the deer? <laughs> well, we, we've had a, you know, this is the standard Kalila label, and it's been like this since the beginning, since batch one, which is batch 23, and every reiteration of the label, something small happens in the background. So we've had extra <laughs> deer in the background. We've had seagulls. We've had the weather changing uh, and we just thought it'd be funny if we just have a seagull crash into the window because of birds flying into windows. We've had people, you know, the T-shirts change colour, the deers move around a little bit, they get a bit closer, they get a bit further away. So, so this is the Kalila label, always the Kalila label. But we do have one little change between each batch. So people will look at it and think, oh, I've tried this one before. Well, probably not this batch because they most of the time they are single cask and, and, and really quite small batches. Mm -hmm. but we just change the light and because we're not allowed to write big letters Kalila as an independent bottler because the name Kalila we can we can put it we're allowed to name it if we are allowed to name it we can say it but that that font of the distillery name must be smaller than our logo our, our company name and our company name is that boutique whiskey company and so the font must be smaller than this font up here 
which is why you can't see it. And when you you can see it on the screen here, quite clearly, it says Kalila, but on a on a bottle, it's big. Mm -hmm. And then the label, it, it, I, you can't actually see. I can't read it without my even with my reading glasses. I've got to hold it at arm's length. Have a look at it. So you just, I, I've learned to recognise the labels very very quickly because they're all distinctive. And I can tell which is it, which is which. And I was just looking at, I was just doing a training session for um, people at work just this week, earlier this week, and the week before. Um, We've gone. We've got over two hundred and two hundred and twenty-four different labels now. So we've bottled seventy-nine of the ninety-five single malt distilleries of Scotland, the the old school ones, everything older than Kilhoman. So, and and obviously some of them have four or five labels for distilleries like Brookladdy or Loch Lomond, where they have lots of different marks. Some of them we haven't been able to bottle them as a single malt because it's been a teaspoon malt. We've bottled three now of the new 45 distilleries, 45 new distilleries operational in Scotland now. That's everything newer than Kilhoman with Daft Mill, uh, Daft Mill starting us off there because they both opened in 2005, but Daft Mill never said anything for many, many years. We've bottled six of the seven grain distilleries. We've bottled all seven of the closed grain distilleries, recently cold closed, uh, and lots of other closed distilleries we've just bottled our first ever imperial which i'm pretty impressed with um delicious um and we bottled whiskey from right around the world so there's 224 individual distillery labels plus all the cost custom ones like the cinema labels and stuff like that that we messed around with the youngest whiskey we've ever bottled and we're not allowed to call it whiskey it's just 40 days old that was an English whiskey, 40 days old, wheat spirit, absolutely delicious. Never been in a cask. Um, it's just had in a, in a bun with oak spindles in it, which is really, really cool. Now, the oldest we've bottled is 53-year-old and everything in between. The uh, palette on this, I'm really digging. It's uh, kind of tarry. Um, it's not as typical of Kalila, and I think it's because most Kalila we see is either refill or, or straight X bourbon. Um, but there's a nice tarry note there. It's very chocolatey from the sherry. There's some nice licorice tones in there too. Um, and the peat is, it's it's sort of softer and ashier than I would typically expect from Kalila, but it's a lovely whiskey. It is, it is it's a really good, um, yeah. I mean, Sam won um, Blender of the Year last year, at the end of last year at the Spirits Business Awards, which is a huge accolade. Uh, and we also won Independent Bottler of the Year as well, which was uh, another great uh, award for us. But yeah, Sam has uh, really been doing some really tasteful uh, finishing on some of these whiskies that just changes the profile just enough um, to, to really make him interesting. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm really impressed with some of the stuff that he's been doing. Mm -hmm. We've just done a lightly finished Highland Park 17 in PX, which is just beautiful mm -hmm. and he also happens to be a fairly decent human being um it should be said and canadian and canadian that's right <laughs> although he's now lived most of his life in the uk i think but but still yeah he uh Hi. he's a home homegrown hero and he's spending most of his time in norway at the moment mm -hmm. yeah Everyone enjoying that. I love that that sort of ashy finish that it comes across on that Kalina. Mm -hmm. No, it's lovely. Uh, are we going to skip back to the Highlands now, Dave? We can. Let's do this one. Mystery Highlands. Yeah, I have. We we have no idea where this comes from. <laughs> Seriously, we bought it completely. We're not allowed to know where it comes from. I've done my research and I've got a couple of ideas. Uh, this is the chain of command. This is Chinese whispers uh, uh, because we don't know. So this is basically all of the team at the time. A lot, uh, some of the guys have moved on actually now. Felix is now um, working for Berry Brothers and Rudd. But yeah, this is the team. Toby's whispering to Felix, whispering to Phoebe. Phoebe's the real boss. She's the one who really keeps us in control. 
Um, she's actually skiing at the moment in Europe. Uh, there's Josh. There's Aaron and, uh, with the headphones on. And Aaron's talking. To, uh, Liz is talking to Tom. Tom's talking to Sam. I'm there. And then there's one of our artists. And then there's Ryan. And then at the end here is Emily, the artist who draws them all. So we went for a sort of a Chinese whispers because we don't know where this comes from. And... And Dave, did they intentionally um, put less effort into drawing Sam? Is, is uh, there something intentional about that? He he's yeah he, he doesn't want to be on a label, and that's how he wanted to be. It's, 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 is it a South Park character? Oh, so it's yeah the the the, the floppy head. Is it the is, okay. is it a Canadian? I don't know. I don't watch TV, so it's, I wouldn't know. I know what all, South Park is. All Canadians have heads that flop rather than mouths that move. That's I how they see. distinguish them from Americans on South Park. So no, that's, that's funny. I didn't realize that was a South Park reference. Yeah, we, we had um, Sam on the label for another one that we did. And we had him as a scarecrow. And we've had him in the, as a, in, in the fun police label for our Campbelltown. And, and, and he's always, always depicted in a white lab coat. Um, and and that's Sam in his lab, basically. And uh, yeah, it's just a it's just a silly in-house joke there, because mm -hmm. uh, it is a, a, a South Park reference, I believe. I think it was his idea. It's a good. One. So we have no idea where this comes from. So Dave, I'm I'm curious to know. Well, tell us about the whiskey, and then I'm curious if you're willing to share your insights into what you think it is, and maybe well, people yes. I don't think you can. I, th I think it's um, 2003. We bought a load of, um, we bought a lot of this and um, we've been sitting on it and putting on in different things, all all fillings, all Highland, all pleated. Uh, 2003, 2004, 2005, I think we've got sitting in cask. And this has been in, well, obviously we're getting this as fillings. Uh, and I think this was a distillery starting to do some peated work mm. uh, for, for a project that they were working on. This is, you know, we always look for these these things in there. So I, yeah, lots of people are putting in suggestions and saying it's up. Well, Ard we knew it wasn't Ardmore because we were allowed to name Ardmore. Um, it's, and it's definitely not Ardmore. Like it doesn't have, for better or worse, Ar Ardmore is a distillery that I struggle with a little bit and I don't always love. But this doesn't have the Ardmore DNA to it um kevin's saying maybe lock lomond um that's a good shout lock lomond is a good good shout there's a possibility i can't i haven't actually de dug into when they started peating i must admit the only uh, lots of, you know, you, lots of people have been suggesting distilleries and and then i call up the distillery manager and say when did you start peating oh okay a little bit too late uh, because you've got to remember all space side distilleries are, are highland distilleries so there's some space sides in the ben, ben React started peating in 2003 um and i think i knock started peating in 2003 too so they all fit in the bill well well actually dave i mean um ben Riek, i mean when they reopened they were peating but they were also peating in the 70s the 80s and the 90s so were, for sure yes. um i don't know it's been i haven't had kuboken this old like peated to matin but there is something reminiscent of like that kuboken or tomatin style to it on so i don't know that would be my guess if i was going to throw a wild guess out there to, as to what i thought it might be but then i'd be shocked that they would sell heated stock that old when they're in the process of build, building that brand i think someone else was sitting on this for a while and we bought it off of someone else mm. Mm -hmm. I know where they bought it from, and I've got a feeling they were hanging on to it. They were, they're, they're a smart bunch, and I think they've been hanging on to it since uh, not long after this started. When they, you know, doing their trials, I think this is some of the trials. Hmm. And and there's a mixture. There's definitely a mixture of different styles of peat in there as well, which lends me to think of uh, uh, the, the Highland Distillery. That were doing different things around 2014 they released a peated line that's why i think it could be a lot but i have no idea it's just a, a guess just a hunch yeah well and again we've not 
I mean, they've, the distilleries never released peated whiskey that old. Um, everything they've released has been kind of sub 10 year old. So it'd be hard to really draw that comparison, but yeah, yeah. another interesting guess. Yeah, people have said, you know, Glen Tara, like people, people have said Glen, Glen Murray, people have said all sorts of things, and even gone on to the islands as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah this is follow also an ex bourbon, and uh, it's just uh, cracking. Mm -hmm. What's this, 50%, 50.9? And uh, I'm just trying to think here, do we get a different version of this from. Uh, no, that was that was batch two. Here, I'm just going to share that for everybody so that you've got it. The price on this one, uh, Chris was asking about the Kalila. The Kalila is 112. This Highland 18 year old is quite reasonably priced. Um, it is barely more than the Kalila uh, at 130. Um, Dave, is there a connection between this whiskey and one of your one of your core range whiskeys by chance? There, there is, but from different casks, yeah. This is, this is one we put together. The core range 18, which is actually my favorite, has I think comes from some, some different casts, or certainly a lot of different casts, um, because it's a bigger batch. Um, but this one's PX Oloroso and Bourbon, first bill 18. Um, and th this is 45.8 ABV. Uh, it's my favorite of the cores at the moment, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And it does sit alongside are you put it up against the talisker 18 and it sits perfectly alongside it do it if you haven't if, if you've got something in 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 the shop do it against the talisker 18 and the highland park 18 and i'm it sits next to talisker 18 more than it does highland park 18 the, the highland park 18 is not the highland park 18 that i remember when the old red label it's not the same as that but it doesn't sit as nice against it but it sits beautifully against the uh talisker dave jokes on you we don't get talisker 18 in canada because diageo is useless um and yes a, i did say that on a recorded live streamed video and i don't care because they are useless unfortunately I, diageo canada they make diageo makes great whiskeys but they're disastrously managed in this country so we never see talisker 18 Really, I mean, we don't see it very often over here either because it, the price has just gone. Yeah. You know where I used that. to have to buy it? Places like Hawaii. Like I can't get it here, but I could buy it in Hawaii. Is that right? Yeah. Anyway, yeah, we, we it used to be about eighty eighty five pound a bottle. It's about one hundred eighty five bottle pound a bottle these days. So uh, yeah, it's off for off now. Off. Until the, but anyway, we don't need to dwell on that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Dave, this is a great whiskey. I'm I'm interested to know that the uh, the the Highland your core range Highland 18 is from a different parcel of casks, but possibly a similar source because uh, the price on that's great. It's a 700 mil bottle. It's almost the same price. It's not admittedly 50.9. It's a little bit lower ABV, but uh, yeah, it's a great um, it's a great whiskey. I tried it before they came in. I haven't tried it since it arrived i probably should give it another uh give it another spin it's a different flavor profile mm. i'll put it up against it now why not because i can yes it's much saltier mm. There's, a, there's definitely a sideline edge on this one. Mm, it's more marathon. Yes, yeah, definitely. Anyway, it's good. They're both good. Yeah. I love this label. I love this seeing the whole team there. That's mm -hmm. really cool. <laughs> and the one floppy headed Canadian. <laughs> Dr. Whiskey. Yeah. All right, Dave, Mystery Isla, we have two. What can you tell we us do. about this Back to the Future Dram? Okay, this, have we done something with this one, the 13-year-old? We did. I think we did. Um, we're going to do the 13 first, yes. 
Uh, so this was distilled in 2009 and we sort of did a little finish in this in Oloroso as well because obviously it was it was it was water white. Um, sometimes we're allowed to say what distillery our whiskeys come from. Um, sometimes you know, if that that often happens when we're um, sometimes we're not allowed. Uh, often when we when we buy direct from a distillery, they 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 will dictate. dictate. And on our core range, we are not allowed to say say where it comes from. Um, that's down to a deal with suppliers. Basically, if we want to have a continuous supply of stock, then we we have to do what they say. So we don't name it. Um, the beauty about being boutique whiskey is that if we're told we're not able to name it, because we don't actually say it on the label, we haven't named it. We just use the same label that we put on a Lafroy that we had named. Oh, did I say? Um, so we use the same labels. So yeah, we have a secret malt that we can just use the malt that label. Um, we could, yeah, that's, that's the beauty of being a, an independent bottler with a with a recognizable picture label rather than actually writing it down on the on the label in, in, so yeah we we haven't said this is Lafroig anywhere um but it does use our Lafroig or our Williamson label so this was 2009 um and then we finished in Oloroso Octo by ourselves so mm -hmm. this is just a finish Ooh. And those two chaps on there, they are a couple of whiskey bloggers from Birmingham. I don't think they're actually active as a whiskey blogger anymore, but they're still whiskey drinkers. Uh, Living Room Whiskey Guide, they won mm. a competition that Master of Mortal Running on one Feshila. And uh, to be on the first, the next Isla distillery. And so they've been immortalized on our Lafroig label. They stand there every time we bottle a bottle of Lafroig or Secret Isla number three uh, and, and they turn up on the label with their living room whiskies because they used to go to every fresh eater yeah when they, and single and free but it, now they're fresh is, is a commitment especially in this era of calmac challenges um that uh people are quite concerned about this is very lafroy esque it reminds me i can't remember which cartridge edition it was that was there was a i think a px finished cartridge edition and this reminds me a little bit of that that whiskey, but it definitely has that Lafroy medicinal DNA on the back end. That's right. They did have a PX one, didn't they? In the um, mm -hmm. yeah, I might have some if, of that now. If my colleague Kurt was here, he'd be able to tell us instantly. Um, but I mean, I love Lafroy, but I'm not one of those people that uh, eats, sleeps, and breathes Lafroy. So it, it's not on the top of my head as to which edition they did, but um, I'm sure I could figure it out here um yeah <clears throat> kurt kurt you're right jeff kurt is predominantly ardbeg but he does uh religiously follow the karchus releases as well or um, I, I think to say it pr properly you almost have to say car chase uh yeah it's, it's i think it's car chase yeah you're right yeah yeah, you you see this one's got the little NCS in there, so it is actually how it came out. We've just bottled that at natural car strength, which is why we've got it at a fifty eight point one. Uh, it was the twenty twenty one Karchus was the PX release, so there you go. Oh, it's quite new. Yeah, twenty one. It's quite new. Uh, scrolling through the chat here jeff is not looking forward to this part of the tasting because he's worried he'll end up spending money um <clears throat> yeah this is a nice bottling of lafroig as it were i mean especially for the for the age the, the finishing on it is a nice light touch it's not over the top um very fruity as well too quite expressive but the peat and the salt and those medicinal tones are still they've got a they've got quite a grip on this one respectfully finished <clears throat> indeed yes respectfully finished is what i'd say and we've got a pair of them you can see on, on this label here there's lots of things going on i think it's like a back to the future sort of 
thing going on here. Yeah. But there's there's a lady flying on the um, heat shield. Yeah, that's Bessie Williamson flying on there. And you'll see very quickly if I just flick. You see the differences there. She moved. She moves. So they're the two differences. Yeah, I think there's a there's a little bit of a lightning strike, uh, the cloud strike in there. So there's always a little difference between. It's always the same, but little things happen between each batch. They've got their fascial t-shirts on as well, too. Um, someone's wrestling an amoeba-like monster. Do you know what the scoop on that is, Dave? It's another science fiction movie. Ah. I think. I don't think it's part of the Back to the Future. Uh, this is the master of malt um, Land Rover, I think. That I think that's supposed to be the master of malt Land Rover that appears in a number of different um, Isla labels over the time. Uh, yeah, I think the ch clock changes time from time to time as well on some of the other ones, but uh, I'm not sure what that thing is. It's it's um it's it's an alien and it's out of an alien movie. I'm pretty certain, but like I say. TV references go straight over my head. Mm -hmm. We should have my wife here for that side of things, Dave. Uh, she she consumes an inordinate amount of TV. She's a big fan of right. popular culture. So if I know things about popular culture, it's usually because of her. Um, before we move on to the 29, good price on the 13-year-old. It is 120, I believe. I think that's what I just saw, 120. And then uh, it's Big Brother uh, comes in at a little higher price point, but we'll talk about that later. Still not bad for 30-year-old Isla single malt. So Dave, romance us on, I'm already nosing it, romance us on the 29 year. Oh, well, this, this is um, 1993. 19, where do I put it? Yeah. 1993. I think this has been a novel or so octave as well. And again, um, natural cast strength, so 52.1. So we've just popped this into um, Oloroso for a little while, just to give it a little bit more dimension than the plain fillings that we've got. Quite chalky, isn't it? Yeah, but it's... Um... The palette on this is yeah. Then it comes. It, it's like a, a a dirty mop bucket of tropical fruit. Like it yeah, is. There it comes. Yeah. When I first poured it, it's got a little bit of that chalkiness coming through, but um, which I quite like. I must admit. Oh. But, uh, yeah. There it comes. All comes the tropical fruit. Even on the nose, it's going tropical. Like that's lush, but like yeah. just really yeah, lovely. Okay. So this would have been at the lower ppm. 1993 they didn't put they, they changed they they raised the peak levels up in the late 90s um the early 90s they were much lower oh yes this is lovely isn't it? well there was there i don't know if this is a change they've switched back but i actually can remember uh dave a time in uh probably the late 2000s where they were talking about how they'd shortened their fermentation they'd um they were trying to maximize production so they'd switch yeast strains so that they could ram production through so i mean prior to like the mid 2000s like lefroig had it wasn't an enormous difference but they went from like 60 plus hours down to i think at one point it was around 50. um and you know things like that are going to have an impact on the spirit character as well yeah but they, they they did make a conscious decision to increase the PPM in the malt because people were asking for a PTU and PTU and Ardbeg next door was putting the PTU. But they, they, they were running Ardbeg for a little while as well. The guys from Lafroy would go down and run Ardbeg when it was closed, when it's malt mm -hmm. in the 80s. Um, but yeah, they did, they did at the end of the 90s, they put a, a conscious decision to raise the PPM. So this would be slightly lower PPM. No. Oh. Loads of smoke on the palate. Um, oh. The finish, you know, with these older peated malts, Dave, I find they, the, the peat gets tamed, it softens, it becomes oilier over time. Mm. Um, but occasionally, Lafroy bottlings will have this 
firm smoke that especially into the finish carries on like it, it actually manages to 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 i guess outdo time to a certain extent because this is still quite smoky after 30 years i'm i'm sort of impressed it's delicious yeah you don't see i mean well, i think the oldest one the five we bottled them nine it was a 20 year old i think mm. well i think that's one behind me somewhere in the back cabinet well dave like i mean because all i mean all these things will will have an impact as well too so what like how much would like just between us friends here had this been a cask of proper lafroig as opposed to isla malt you can't name but you can hint at and joke about like that would certainly have an impact as to what it would be get priced at as well wouldn't it like well if there was uh, 20 yeah, it, it, names it's, LeFroig, it'd it's be a what we price. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it it would be priced an awful lot higher because we would have to pay an awful lot more money. We we don't put the price up just because we can name it. We don't put the price up. And particularly, we do not have a pricing structure that, well, we can name it, we're going to put it up here, we'll make more. No, it's, it's about what we can buy it on. We have the same pricing structure across whatever we buy. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, sometimes we have to narrow that margin down, especially with some of these new craft distilleries where we know we're going to be paying a lot of money for mm -hmm. um, uh, the the whiskey that we 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 take a narrower cut just because we think it's cool. To, to, but, to but I guess the flip side to that, Dave, is if you're buying the stock from someone and they can name it and you can name it, then they're going to charge you more. I would, yeah, I, I, and that, we get hit. Yeah, we we probably take the hit. For, for buying it more yeah what we get sold and we have a higher price if you can name it absolutely you know the, the, you know that island number two that we had unnamed was a very very good price for a 25 year old um Ardberg. um but if we'd um if we'd have been able to name it it would have been a much much higher if they'd been able to sell it as a as a name distillery they would have been able to get a lot more money for it as a, as a name distillery as a part from a yeah absolutely Cool. All right, we've got one last whiskey to talk about. And then I don't know if I've done this with you before, Dave, but but I like to do the speed round, which is go back through the whiskeys and see how they've changed over the course of the tasting before we have our vote. Um, so what's what's next? We've got, uh, is it a Lecheg? Yeah, we've got a Lecheg. We have. Off on. We have. We have. This is another natural cask strength label here as you can see the little ncs up here this is a 21 year old bottle at 58.2 percent abv this is from september 1997 and this was matured in a single sherry butt until we bottled it so we bought a sherry butt we didn't do anything to this uh we just bought it and we were offered it and uh that's 21, 21 year old. I love it when that happens. It always works out well for me. So Dave, you'll love this. Jeff, one of our participants, he's had to duck out because he's got another tasting to go to and he has a bus to catch, which you you have to respect, you know, the, the use of public transportation rather than doing something foolish like drinking and driving. So kudos to you, Jeff. But uh, one tasting down, he's got one more to go to. Um, nice. This is, uh, I mean... I think most of the guys on this tasting are probably big, uh, big Lecheg fans. I'm a, I'm a on the fence Lecheg guy. It goes one way or the other for me. Um, but yeah, this is this is so briny. This is, I mean, it it's I don't know how to describe it. It's like someone like putting vinegar in a hot tub. It's oily. It's earthy. It does, yeah. It's really oily and earthy, and then that herbal note comes through, and the blue cheese. It you know, yeah, absolutely smoke smoked cheese. So, and there's a rubbery note. So, Dave, you you wouldn't have been on the other end of one of these notes, but like in hockey dressing rooms, they have these hard rubber mats so you can walk on them on your skates. And Lecheg to me often smells like if you were to smear blue cheese into one of those rubber mats that are slightly wet. That's what <laughs> it looks like. 
backdrop is in much hope for you. Yeah, that's a that's a an odd reference, point of reference there. Absolutely, but yeah, blue. Yeah, definitely that sort of smoky cheese notes to come through. Yeah, the chick has ups and downs, and you, it's it's one of those distilleries that's much unloved over the years, isn't it? I mean, it really has been a, a troubled history, much like early Brooklady, up and down, up and down. Um, Tobermory Distillery had that sort of checkered history all the way through. It became a <laughs> holiday. It became a cheese warehouse. It actually did become a cheese warehouse, and this is this sort of was cheese, cheese. Um, it was it was a cheese storage facility for a while, and say holiday lets, and yeah, a lot of. Was that the lot famous of pile of malt cheddar, Dave? <laughs> it, there's, there's smoky cheese to it, that's for sure, and then some sort of tobacco notes that come through as well. But the the, the mouth is really good. it's a really nice little jig, I must admit. Oh, it's. It's like liquid smoke on my palate. Like it is, it is really intense. Um, it's actually fairly clean. Like I often find Lecheg is a very dirty single malt. And I don't mean that as a criticism. It's just stylistically, it's very dirty. This is a, a much cleaner Lecheg than I'm typically used to. It's, it's, it is, it's a good one. Yeah. I mean, we, 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 we don't tend to bottle the ones that we don't like. But, um, but we, do, you know, we, we, we do try everything that we get. So, uh, Lecheg is one of those whiskeys, though, where you can get away with it because the people who like Lecheg seem to, I think they seem to revel in it being almost slightly off putting at times. It's like that Swedish fish that, like that fermented Sir Strumming or whatever. I think people take pride in enjoying uh, something that most people would find completely revolting. It's a nice one to finish on, I must admit. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, clean. I mean, obviously, Dave, what did you say the cast makeup on this one was again? This was a single sherry butt. You know, sherry butt. It's funny you say that because, like, it again, it, it, it doesn't come across overly sherried to me. It's probably a refill butt, but it was a sherry butt. Mm -hmm. Well... Uh, it's lovely. I'm going to find, make sure I've got the right one here so that I can. Uh, uh, it's, yeah, it's, not, it's, re, it's refill sherry for sure. <laughs> the color of it is refill sherry. Well, it makes me wonder then if it's also potentially like, I mean, as a lot of them are, an, a refill American oak sherry, but because to me, there's almost more bourbon notes to it, like American oak notes to it than there is sherry notes. Um, okay. Wood policy back in this this period in time at this distillery was all over the show. <laughs> I mean, it really was all over the show. They didn't have any money. It was opening, it was closing. Uh, you know, they, they do peated runs for six months and then unpeated runs for the, the remainder of the year. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it was all over the show. We've had Le Chig, we bought Le Chig that's completely unpeated because the cast was labelled up and they put Tobermory in. Mm -hmm. uh, it was there was not a lot of love going on for this distillery around this time. There's quite a lot of um sort of lechig around this sort of age that's all over the show. Yeah, yeah there wasn't a great deal of love. Is it real like you say, real hit and miss uh, picking them now out. Some of them are not very good. We've tried some of nothing. Yeah. Well, Dave, I mean, not, like if you look at the industry and where it was at at that point in time, like this is before the boom kicks off, like early 2000s, yeah. uh, you know, distillery, it, I'm sure that it wasn't until the mid to late 2000s that people were starting to say, hey, what exactly are we doing at Tobermory Distillery? And should we maybe have a look at what our best practices are? Because this whiskey thing is starting to take off. Because it would have been in, it wouldn't have been in even the, the first, the, well, it certainly wasn't in the first, and it probably wasn't even in the second tier of distilleries uh, where they would have started paying attention to those things. So who knows? I mean, you know, you've got this remote island distillery that could be frankly doing whatever it wanted, and who is going to, who is going to call them on it? They're meeting their production targets, and that's all that anyone asked. 
most of this stuff went i mean when when burn stewart took it over i think that's when it had a period of stability and things started to get a little bit better and that wasn't until much later i mean it, it was it was closed in 1930 and it stayed closed right up until 1972 mm-hmm. and then it was up and down and it was up and down and it was disappeared and it came back and when burn stewart came in and took took it over and they did give it a period of stability and things started to get a bit better and they were using it in um, their, their blend, their, their black bottle. I think it's going into a lot of their black bottle. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, this is you know, Dave. We talk about whiskeys that are top dressing malts, and usually it's because they're elegant or classic or have a profile. In a way, this could be a top dressing malt for a whole other reason. If you just wanted to add it a bit of a bit of pack or a bit of oomph, like just a little punch of something in there. Add a little bit of this into your blend and it's definitely going to have an impact. A bit of funk. Yeah. All right. So we do the speed round. I don't know if you have all of your whiskeys in front of you, Dave, or if you want to play it, but like, I'm going to quickly go through them just to revisit them, see how they've evolved. Again, if everyone, if, if you want to put your comments in the chat as we go, we're going to have a vote in a couple minutes time here, but starting going back all the way back to that Glenn Lovett at the very start of the tasting. Um, I mean, it just, it's soft, it's fruity. It reminds me, I don't know if you get them, but there's these licorice candies called goodies. It reminds me of opening a bag of goodies, which is like fruit, artificial fruit flavors, but with this little hint of licorice in there as well. The palate, oh man, that still holds up. It's a creamy, delicate, tropical fruit bomb. Absolutely gorgeous. That's a banging, banging whiskey. Um, did you buy that blind or did you get a sample? Did you buy that blind or did you taste no, it? No, you know what? I I was tempted to buy a blind and then Sam sent us a sample uh, and that sealed the deal. Right. To be totally honest, um, you know, even when the price is great, I especially with the way our customers treat our single casks and the trust they put in us, we have to, we have to try it to buy a cask because if we buy something bad and put our name on it, then they won't buy the next one. Um, Cause there's people who don't get the chance to try it ahead of time, but it's, it's gorgeous. The Adnams has opened up nicely sitting in the glass, um, like nice honey tones, malt, lots of apple. It's good whiskey. I mean, they are making some really nice whiskey. Yeah. The palate's interesting. There's like a celery salt, sort of uh vibe to it there's something almost mezcal like not even mezcal but like tequila like about it on the palate um sammy's saying peanuts uh yeah it's uh there's definitely peanuts on the nose for sure interesting cool um millstone on to the millstone again that's the thing about the speed round, Dave, is it goes goes fast and furious. It does, um, yeah. Oh, man. Someone was commenting on the nose on this earlier about how it was really rye-like. I think that was Jeff who's now left. There is like a rye-like note to this on the nose, like a millstone rye. Palette still holds up. Again, you can tell it's young, but not four years of age. Um, I believe this was PX, was it not, Dave? Uh, it was, it was yeah. Cask. yeah, it works it really well with the sherry. Uh, with the, the sherry works really well with the peat on this. It's a, it's a lovely, lovely cask. We've uh, we've actually got, and this is a bit of a, a uh, well, it'll be a while, but we've actually got a Kensington Wine Market Millstone Sherry cask coming this fall. So something to look forward to. If I remember correctly, it is not peated though. It's an unpeated. Oloroso cask, but uh, it's our third millstone. We've done a couple of rise up until now, but I'm excited to do that that particular cask. Uh, Kalila. It wasn't very Kalila-esque on the nose when we first tried it because of the sherry, but it, it is starting to come out that seafoody, bacony note that I often get in Kalila's there. I saw charred lemons come across eventually. Oh, yeah, especially on the palate. Um, 
So Dave, for me, my, my, my two Kalila, well, there's three Kalila styles in my mind. You've got your like scallop Kalilas, you've got your bacon Kalilas, and then sometimes you get the bacon wrapped scallop Kalila, which to me is the real, the real winner. Um, and this has got a little bit of both, but it's more leaning to the scallop side, drizzled in lemon, poached in butter. It's a, uh, it's a lovely, even with the sherry, like that, that sort of buttery, scallop tone comes out really nicely um highland mystery highland from a distillery somewhere between Loch lomond and pulteney which is or no i guess what i wolfburn somewhere between wolfburn and Loch lomond geographic well, all island distilleries are highland as well though aren't they it's true. Well, except Lag. Uh, Lag's got an interesting claim to being a lowland distillery. The SWA yes. would say it's a highland, but it is technically south of the lowland highland boundary fault. It's, it, it's, it's, yeah, Islas, part of Islas, more south than mm. let's go as well. It's really the, the, the interesting thing with the Highland is how clean it is following uh, the Kalila and the Millstone, especially. But very smooth, very elegant. Uh, Island number three, our first of two Lafroigs. That would be the 13 year old first, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. The P and this was again, it was PX Sherry as well, right? It was, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was all I'll say. Oloroso. Oloroso, yeah. Yeah, that's, that is a, I mean, it's, it's retained its Lafroig essence, even after 13 years, it's big Isla, um, lovely, elegant, yeah, nice, nice balling again. Uh, but what about that 29? Oh, that's just Man. delicious, isn't it? That's a little drop of liquid history there. Juicy fruit bubblegum meets Dettol cleaning agent. <clears throat> so I'm just going to have a little drop more. Why not? I I wish we all had a little drop more of that, but we don't. So you're, you're a lucky man, Dave. Uh, I pinch myself every morning. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> I, I can't help. I'm already on to the lecheg. It, it kind of seems like eating like beef barbecue ribs in a hot tub is where I'm at right now. I don't know that I would ever recommend that someone do that. I'm, I'm more in the forest floor. But not being a big meat eater. So uh, oh. more, more of an earthy, moth, mossy forest floor, damp wood. Uh, rotten wood, crumbly wood. Mm. The beetles have eaten it. It's all mossy. There's mushroom growing out of it. Oh, the palate is like it's just mouth drying smoke and salt and something blue cheese moldy. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's as I said, it's very clean, clean lecheg. All right. I'm going to fire up the poll here for everyone so you, you get a chance to vote. So, uh, provided and it looks like he did evan has set up the poll hopefully in the correct order it looks no it's not in the correct order so you're going to have to watch carefully the isla and the Kalila got switched but uh the poll is up there you've got a, a few minutes to vote now dave um you're a very you know a very nice fellow probably not one to pick favorites and being that these are all your whiskeys you know like they're it's like asking you to pick your favorite child yeah. but if i were to ask you if you if you were able to have an extra dram of any three of these whiskeys tonight which ones would they be oh yeah i've been dramming all morning today um yeah um I, yeah I, I i love the millstone the millstone is superb I, everything this man does i just love patrick anyway and so the millstone is definitely up there the 29 year old i think is superb I think it's a beautiful uh, Lefroy. Uh, so I've got one more. Where should I go? 
29 year old looks like. I love the ad numbers. The ad numbers is great. I'm going to go for you. I'm, I'm sure your space side is delicious because I've got one here. Um, I'll, I'll be sure this. to bring you a sample along with Davin's book next yeah. time. Next time. I'm <laughs> yeah. I go for your space side. I would pick if I could have another big drama. You it would be your space side right now. Yeah. Oh, that's sweet. That's sweet of you to say. It it, it is it is a lovely whiskey, and I have to say, it it is my second favorite. It would have been my second pick from tonight's lineup. Um, I'm a little spoiled living in my ivory tower of whiskey drinking, but uh, that Isla number three, 29 year old, is without question my favorite whiskey in the lineup tonight. Um, I really wish I had a ball of that, that I could top that one up in front of me. And if I had to pick one more, it would be the Kalila. Uh, that's a lovely Kalila. Um, the sherry integration in it's nice. It's not over the top, just adds a nice nuance to it. All of these whiskeys had something interesting about them. And to be honest, the one I was most nervous about, uh, because I've had a lot of, there's there's a lot of good craft whiskey out there, but there's also a lot of very average craft whiskey out there. And I was a little anxious about the Adnams, but it actually did a lot better than I thought it was going to do, even within this lineup. Um, so that one gets an honorable mention. But if I were to pick four, I would have voted for that Millstone too, Dave. It's it's lovely. Um, Josh is saying he's really curious about the Highland now. Great value all around. Uh, I'm going to check in on the voting because... Dave, we need to we need to cut you loose here soon so that you can get on with ending yesterday or starting to tomorrow, whichever whichever one you're choosing to do here. Um, but it looks like everyone who could have voted has voted. So the people have spoken as it were. And the winner is the hmm. Isla number three, 29 year olds. Yeah. And then it's a tie between the Highland and the Isla number three batch seven 13 year. Wow. So you like yeah, pe people like their Pete here. Um like their Pete, yeah. and then for second favorite, it is Highland 18 year, a tie then for second between the Space Side 24, the Kalila, and the Isla 13 year. So there's a lot of preference here tonight for your Mystery Highland Distillery, Lafroig, uh, especially. It looks like those did very well, but votes for almost everything else. Um, and I'm sure that some of them, if we'd allowed them a third vote, would have also picked the Adnams bottling as well. Now, Dave, before we wrap, uh, do you want to give us, like, do you have any, any tidbits of things we should be looking from in the months to come? Obviously... We're a few months behind the UK in terms of what gets released on this side of the pond, but uh, anything we might want to keep our eyes out for in the future. Well, you've got the core range in now, haven't you? You do have the core range. That's right. Yeah. So that's what I've got here right behind me, which is, um, I, you know, for a long time, I've always said that we wanted a core range for boutique. When I was out there pouring all of these great whiskeys, every whiskey show. And I love having a, a different box of toys to play with every time I go out to, to a whiskey show that's great as a, as a whiskey geek it's perfect but at the same time you want that sort of recognition of and, and and to bring new people into whiskey so we finally did launch a core range uh september i think last year end of september beginning of october last year uh, which is a core range of a single malt from isla um a single malt from the space side. So we've got an eight-year-old Isla, we've got a 12-year-old space side, we've got an 18-year-old Highland, a 30-year-old blended grain, uh, and so and an, an eight-year-old Canadian. These are all stuff that we've finished ourselves. So obviously, when you buy Scotch whiskey over here, you buy fillings as a as an independent bottle, you get fillings. To, to be to have a core range, you have to buy a lot of whiskey. Uh, and not only do you like to have to buy a lot of whiskey, you've got to have that supply coming through. And that's why we're not allowed to name because we're buying from some big people and they say, you can't. Uh, but you've got to buy a lot of fillings uh, and then you've got to do stuff with them. So you've got to put them into different casks, which we've done, and then you've got to marry them and get the profile right. This is what Sam has done. So our Isla is um, tastefully done in refill 
bourbon and sherry car. So not first fill, this is refill. So we wanted the Isla character to really come through. It's a, it's a nice golden colour. It's the lightest of them. It's only eight years old. Uh, our labels all have these. Uh, we, we, we went for that Scottish stag symbol, basically, on them. You know, the Scottish stag. We wanted we, we wanted to be cheeky at the same time. We wanted to tell stories. And so we start off with a very young, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. This has all been done by Emily Chapel. We start off with a very young on the eight-year-old. Um, and then our 12-year-old, our stag gets a little bit older, a little bit sort of meaner. Uh, there we go. It's a little bit, you know, his little face is just growing up. And then our 18-year-old gets even a bit older. He's now the alpha male now here. A little bit of grey in there, and I just love the thirty-year-old. This is my favourite. Is that, a, is that the twelve-point stag, Dave? The the eighteen-year-old. Um, he's he's probably got about yeah. He's it, this is the real monarch of the Glen. This is the big one. I don't oh, think we've got twelve point. We haven't done a down more. And you just look at his face. I mean, he's just so, he's seen it all. He's not taking shit from anyone. Uh, this is the monarch of the Glen. Now the colours are based upon a colour palette. That I googled uh, uh, Aurora Borealis color palette, and I got this CYMK color palette. I thought, oh man, this is a perfect colors. That's what we want. Northern Hemisphere distilleries. Let's use that. So Emily took that away. All to say, all done by Emily. And then there's a little wavy line over there, <laughs> which is the way the northern lights flicker in the sky. <laughs> You'll notice they've all been uh, bottled at forty-five point eight percent ABV. Every single one of them has been bottled at 45.8. Um, that's another little geekiness. It's the old 80 proof, basically, what all Scotch whiskey used to be bottled at in the 60s. So it's 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 that. It's also close to 46%, which means you doesn't get it doesn't sort of cloud when you it goes cold. Uh, because we haven't got a chill filter. We don't chill filter or anything. It's all naturally colored. We've done say refill. The sherry is a uh, so the the 12 year old space side is sherry finished all 100 percent oloroso the 18 year old is first fill bourbon oloroso and pedro Jimenez, and it is my favorite and it's a beautiful standby for the talisco 18 and it's like i say it sits it's even the same maybe v as a talisco 18 incidentally um and then there's a 30 year old blended grain mm -hmm. um this is uh Three grains in here. There's a lot of North British in here because you've got that creamy, corny um, oiliness from from maize that North British still use. But I think the other ones are Gerben. Mm -hmm. I think it's Gordon in it. Definitely Gerben in it. Uh, and definitely North British because you can taste that immediately. It's in as you put it in. That oily oiliness. <clears throat> what else is that, Dave? Is also worth like for a thirty year old grain, which we used to see a lot of, and we don't anymore. I mean, it's it's 120, I think, Canadian dollars, which, you know, so like, let's call it 70 pounds or 75 pounds. Like, it's great value for grain whiskey, which we don't see anymore. Like, even Compass Box, their hedonism, which was probably 18 to 25 year old grains, that's been discontinued. They're going to launch a new one. So it's a it's a very good value bottling as well. Um, but you forgot one, Dave. You forgot, in some ways, for your audience, the most important one, the moose. I was just bringing it out there, yeah. The the the, the, the silly moose, the Canadian eight-year-old, 100% uh, Oloroso finished. It's it's it, It's been so popular over here. Um, it, we've just run out of... We're, we're, we've had to bring production forward. We can only make um, these in about just over a 1,000 bottles at a time. It's our core range. It's our... Con it, it, we can do it again. We've got stock behind it. We've got stock queued up to go in, but we've had to pull production forward because it's gone quite quickly in five months, much quicker than we expected. It's, it's and the Canadian really has taken off over here. Definitely, it's um, it's one we're putting up against. Uh, the the bartenders have picked it up because it's got so much flavour in it, and that ABV that that just under 46 percent abv it's um that they're, they're using it in cocktails which is which is cool uh against sort of things like bullet bourbon and rittenhouse rye so uh that, that's really cool but it, yes it's 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 a, everybody's favorite when you're talking about oh yeah i'm just trying to canadian because you don't see canadian whiskey over here yeah or very canadian whiskey over here 
Yeah. Well, and you know what, Dave, the funny thing is we've, we've got our own version of the boom in Scottish and English distilleries over here too. And it's, it's going to get, uh, that, that's one of the things I think that's going to be interesting to watch in the years to come. There's, there's probably 60 or 70 distilleries across Canada making single malt and other types of whiskey that are about to hit the market. And, uh, you know, I think in some ways the whiskey industry is in the danger of what happened to beer, which is beer has become hyper-local. Um, yeah. You know, in Canada, like or in Alberta, it used to be English beers and German beers and Belgian beers were what everyone got. And then American craft beer was dominant. And then British Columbia craft beer was dominant. And now, you know, a city like Calgary, we have 46 breweries um, for a city of one and a half million people. I mean, it's crazy. So it'd be interesting to see what happens with the whiskey side of things moving forward, because just in Calgary, there's five distilleries now making whiskey and yeah. uh, they're all, they're all, everyone's got an interesting story to tell too. Yeah. When, when, I, when Davin Dukagamai wrote his first book in his first book, the, the portable whiskey export expert, uh, a history of Canadian whiskey, there was nine distilleries in there. It was just on that start, on the cusp, and he was talking about it's going to explode, it's going to follow American distillery. And when I was looking at his website a couple of months back, because I knew he was bringing it, rewriting the book, uh, I think there was over 300 distilleries in Canada now, craft distilleries with over 100 and... I, 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 got, I think it's something like 180, but maybe, maybe it's, it's, it, was, it was higher than scotch of making whiskey in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, some of these would be, you know, a thread in a shed, a thread in a shed sort of thing. Uh, you know, husband and wife, father and that's son. That's not a brand. It should be a brand, by the way. Thread in a shed. Thread in a shed. <laughs> but it's the same with Australia. You know, we bought all these Australian whiskies, and it's great whiskies. Yeah. Well, and, and you talk about opportunities. I mean, one of the reasons why, and things are really starting to explode in Alberta, is. Um, Alberta is one of, for malt, one of the bread baskets of the world. It supplies almost all the barley for American craft beer. So like if you drink Lagunitas or Ballast Point or, you know, all these famous American craft beers, they get their malt out of Alberta because they can't grow it in California. They don't grow no. it in Colorado. Um, so that's one of the things that is set to really rock the boat. Anyway, well, listen, Dave um you have as always been a gent and uh you know uh, a, a lot of insight into the whiskeys that you have in your brand so i'm very grateful as always for you staying staying up late with us to talk whiskey um oh, by telling me to stop talking about whiskey <laughs> that's up that's up to you uh <laughs> but uh yeah uh I, we had another great range of whiskeys tonight um I'm, I'm going to have to start bugging people on your side of the pond to get us some information about the end of the world series, because Sam included me in one of your videos for that too. I, I, and I should note, I even busted out a Blackberry for that to make it even more Canadian. It probably is. That's, that's really fun. Yeah. That, that, that should be, I think that's scheduled to come on, on Instagram tomorrow. Oh, there you go. So something else to look forward to. My dog is letting me know that my wife has just got home, which is probably as good a time as any to wrap this up. But Dave, once again, thank you very much for this. Look forward to seeing you in person. And I won't forget, I'm going to get a book from Davin for you. I'll get him to scribble something nice in there for you. And I'll uh, I'll bring you a sample of some, some things that uh, probably won't make it over to your side of the pond for you to sample next time I'm over. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. I look forward to seeing you. Well, Dave, thank you again. Thanks, everybody, for taking part in the tasting. The dude does abide. I hope you enjoyed tonight's whiskey. That's a movie reference, Dave. I know you probably haven't seen The Big Lebowski. You'd probably actually like, I think you and the, you'd find common cause with The Dude, as The Lebowski is known. But in any case, until the next time we do this, have a good night. Thanks again. And we'll talk soon. Cheers. Thank you very much for having me. Lovely to see you all. Cheers. Cheers. Take care.